Hey, this is Rakim, EmacsCast episode 6. Today I want to talk about what I call back to the basics. Not just about Emacs, mostly about software in general and how it affects uh, the way I use Emacs and what I think about it. Quick announcement before we begin, I've launched a Patreon. This way you can support this podcast and kind of affect the way it goes forward. You can choose any amount of money to support it per episode, not per month. So if you enjoy this, consider supporting this podcast. It's patreon.com slash emacscast. The link's in the description. And thank you. So let's start with config news as usual. Um, one of the first things I did in my Emacs config was to enable the behavior that is common and I'm used to with the shift, command, and alt keys. In Mac, and I think it's... Uh, in most operating systems, you can move between words with alt and arrows, alt, left, and right. You can jump words in any text anywhere, mostly. And on a Mac, with a command key, you can do the beginning and end of a line. This is something that you can do in Emacs with control A and E by default. And if you hold the shift key, then the same motions will be applied with the selection or what's called an enabled uh, transient region in Emacs. So I wanted to keep these defaults because this is uh, muscle memory for me. I do it all the time. I cannot imagine not having this in my text editor. And it worked fine. It's everywhere, a couple of lines of config, and it works everywhere except org mode. Because in org mode, there are certain things that you do with shift arrows and alt arrows. If you are on a heading, shift left and right on a heading does not select, does not move the cursor, does not select text. It changes the status. So if you have to do's, done's, and you know, different statuses for headings, then shift left and right arrow will switch between those statuses for this heading. And it's handy. It's really easy to, you know, make it to do this way. Alt left and right, or I should say meta left and right on a heading changes the level of that heading. So it's really easy to promote or demote something in org mode this way. By default, these keys don't do much outside of headings. They are only for certain parts of your text. There is a config in Emacs, there's a variable that you can enable that will allow you to use shift almost everywhere except for those places where it actually does status change for headings. And it again, it works fine, but every once in a while I want to do this on a heading. I want to select text with the shift or I want to move between words with alt and it doesn't do what I want. So of course you can do anything with Emacs. You can configure this. So I did. One way to do it is just to disable for org mode those keys, unmap them from the default org mode behavior and then you have the same motions and selections everywhere. But now I just got rid of those really handy features of switching to do statuses and promoting and demoting headings. I was thinking, okay, maybe I can just come up with a nice alternative because when I do these kind of different key bindings, when I create, when I change default behavior or key bindings, I always try to look at what I use more. If something is used more often, then that key binding should be easier. It should include less keys. It should be just simpler. Less often I use something, more obscure or complex that key binding can be. So, okay, promoting, demoting is I don't do all the time, but I do quite often. So maybe it should be something, just two or three keys. So I've tried a couple of combinations. I've tried doing something that makes sense within my config. So it's kind of related to other uh, motions. I still didn't find the best solution to this. But, of course, I googled how do other people solve this. Many people just want to get rid of the arrow keys altogether. So they want some alternative to the arrow keys. So it's kind of a different case. They, I, I want my arrow keys back. They just want to get rid of them. But nevertheless, the idea is the same. They want something to... They want some nice way to do the things that org mode does by default with arrow keys. One of the ways to do that is using Hydras, which is an Emacs package worthy of a whole another episode, I think. But what's interesting is that I found there's another package just for org mode that does add custom motions commands to do these things. But it turns out org mode has a kind of a hidden gem, a secret feature called speed keys. 
it's not really hidden. It's just uh, it's not in the main section of the manual. It's somewhere in the end. So you can enable speed keys. And then if you are on the first line of a heading, the first star, then you can just use certain letters to manipulate that heading and the whole section, of course. If you hit L or R, lowercase L, R, that's the same as Alt, Left and Alt, Right. Promote or Demote or basically move the heading left or right within this hierarchy. If you hit T, as in To Do, you change the status. So this is equivalent of doing Shift, Right. You can hit W to refile, to move this section somewhere else. It's the same as hitting Control C, W. And you can use uppercase U and D to move this section up and down, bubble up or bubble down, as I say. So this is a nice workaround, but you have to be on that first symbol of a heading. Another thing is I got rid of the undo tree. Uh, I've tried many different, not many, but a couple of different uh, extensions to handle the way Emacs does undo and redo, quote, redo. With undo tree, it's nice because you can just have regular undo and redo and you can visualize the tree. But as many others have noted, sometimes it doesn't work and it just says there's no further undo information. Meaning sometimes its data is corrupted for some reason and it's really hard to catch and it's really hard to reproduce. But when it does, you just cannot do anything. You just lost some information, which is unacceptable. So I just ditched the undo tree and I don't do any unusual undos. I just use the built-in Emacs undo. And it's kind of mind-boggling at first. Uh, I think I got used to it. So I already have this muscle memory of if I want to redo, then I just hit space or something. I do something and then I undo again. It goes back. It's kind of hard to explain. There is an excellent Reddit post that explains how undo works in Emacs. There's, of course, the manual. There's also a really nice section about undos in Mastering Emacs book, which is an excellent book for everyone. I will mention it later when I'm going to talk about basic movement stuff in Emacs. Okay, and the last thing which made me really happy and appreciate Emacs once more is, okay, I have a blog. I talked about it in the episode about Hugo and uh, org mode. I launched a new section. It's a web comic I make. Uh, it's just a fun little comic about programming and computing and all that stuff. The way it's published is it's a section in Hugo. Every single post just has an image and that's it. So I, I uh, draw an image on, then move it to my computer, have a JPEG ready. And then all I have to do is create this new post and at first I just thought okay I'll just use this uh, org mode notation to insert images because that will be converted to markdown and then I'll have this image post but then but then there's an easier way since every single post is just that image with different file names I can have it in my template and then just use this custom variable so every post will have a variable that I have to put in which is the name of the file and then it will generate the image tag itself. Last thing I want is the way you set URLs in Hugo is you can choose. You can use the file name or you can set a custom title. The way I want my comics to be on the website is I want them to have sequential numbers so that I can say comic number seven is rakim.org slash honestly undefined. That's the name of the comic, honestly undefined slash seven. And every new comic has to be the next number. So I thought, okay, I'll just make a custom org capture template so that anywhere within Emacs, I can hit a couple of keys and create a new comic. A comic has a title, then file name for the image. And then I have to add this custom URL, which is the next number. So I did that. It's a capture template that asks for these three things and then adds a new entry and I can just hit save and that's it. But then I thought, so I have to remember how many comics there are and then put this new number and I might make a mistake and this is just something I shouldn't do. What should happen is that number should be generated automatically. But how do I do this? First thought is, of course, well, maybe you save this counter somewhere, some sort of a global variable or something and just use that, but it doesn't sound good. And then I thought, well, I know this number. I mean, I can get this number. How many comics 
there are is how many org mode sections is in this file. And of course, org mode has a function that counts the number of headings anywhere, basically. You can provide it with a section or you can provide it with a file name or by default, I think it looks at the current buffer if you just don't provide anything. So all my comics are in a single org mode file. So I changed my template so it doesn't ask for this number. It just looks using this function into the file, counts how many headings there are and uses this number as a basis for my next number. So now I can always create new comics without looking at the existing comics and the number will be there and it will be correct. It just took maybe 15 minutes of research and, and writing at just one line of code. Now it saves me a few seconds and few CPU cycles of mental activity every time I have to add a new comic. And I thought this is, this is really nice. This is something that I probably wouldn't even bother trying in different editors. Before, if I had to do something like this, I will probably have written a, a bash script because that's what I did to make my Jekyll blog nicer to work with. So it's gimmicky and it's kind of ad hoc. This feels really nice. And once again, I just thought I should stop and appreciate because this free open source piece of software allows me to just define the behavior I want and remove friction for the things that I want to create. Now I have less excuses to not add new blog posts or not write new comics because it's so easy. Now I don't have to do much. Uh, all I have to focus is the content itself. As usual, all those configs are on my GitHub. Check them out if you're interested in something similar. All right, so back to basics. You know, you can launch Emacs with a Q flag just dash Q, and it will open Emacs without loading your config. Basically, the way it works, if you just download Emacs and don't do any configuration and just launch it, it's instant, kind of ugly, and it's it has this 80s feel to it. The toolbar is just horrendous, of course. Everything else is, I wouldn't say ugly, it's, it's pleasantly and boldly not modern. It has this default font, which I kind of like. It has this mode line with weird shadowy border and it has this splash screen with the huge Emacs logo. Every time I see that, when I, for some reason, sometimes my config breaks and it just doesn't load or something and I see this default Emacs, I am reminded every time of how fast it is, how snappy everything is, both loading and just operations and uh, how different it is from my config. Now, my config is by no means huge, but it still, it still takes several seconds to load and it's still somewhat slow sometimes, especially when it's about switching buffers uh, or doing some search. Now, I know you can mitigate the loading time by using Emacs as an Emacs client and having the Emacs server running all the time. This will make launching Emacs instant because you're not actually launching Emacs, you're just launching another client for the server that's already running. I am not using that yet. I just didn't have time to fiddle with it, but that's not the point. Yes, you can mitigate this, but I have this feeling lately that I want my software and my tools and basically everything around me to be as lean as possible. And I kind of have this agenda now, or not org agenda, but uh, my personal agenda or my personal desire, should I say, to minimize software in my life. And the reason I got to these conclusions is it's kind of complex, but the catalyst, I think, was the discussions I had lately with different people. Uh, because before I had these ideas and thoughts in my mind, but once you start discussing them openly or just, you know, putting into words, they start becoming more real or more tangible. A friend of mine wrote an article in his blog called Software Disenchantment, and it, it went somewhat viral. And uh, it talks about how everything is bad, everything is slow, everything is bloated, and browsers are horrendous, and people are writing apps that are orders of magnitude more demanding to both memory and CPU resources than operating systems of just, you know, 10 years ago. But we're not seeing the same orders of magnitude improvement in features or user experience or 
anything. It just basically becomes bigger and slower for nothing and how nobody really cares. So we just keep going and keep adding and seems like nobody really thinks about it. It struck many people and the good thing is I guess many people do care since this article was so popular. I wrote an answer to Nikita who's who's the author of that uh, article. Nikita is the guy with whom we work on Grumpy website. It's uh, it's a website where two of us and a couple of other authors write angry and somewhat disappointed and grumpy notes about different bad aspects of user interfaces and user experiences. Anything from, you know, Google buttons that don't look like buttons and don't behave like anything familiar to microwaves or dishwashers. And it's uh, grumpy.website. We just had this idea of having the dumbest name or dumbest domain name possible. So we chose .website. So I wrote an answer to his post uh, where I basically agree with him, but I try to convey an idea that if we want to change this and improve the situation with bad software, then appealing to the developers will probably not work, even though we have the responsibility. We are the professionals. We are who creates this. But as long as people are willing to consume it and willing to pay for it and willing to use it, I think the situation will not change drastically. So I am trying to say that we have to kind of, we have this other responsibility of educating people, of making people more demanding when it comes to software. Because when it comes to most other things, people voice their complaints they kind of push for quality. They want cars that work for years. They want bridges and buildings and cities to basically be there forever and be fixed if something goes wrong. They have an expectation of quality of most things in their lives, especially of things that come out of engineering. But they don't have really any expectation of software. And they kind of got used to the idea that software is this gimmicky stuff that doesn't work and you just, you know, sometimes it sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Who knows what's happening? Who knows how to fix it? There's just ask this computer guy, they will figure it out. That they're so smart, they're so brainy. You have to be a computer geek to figure out why your printer doesn't work. This is, I think, is the core problem. For many people, this is what computing is. It's not stable. It's not reliable. This is the nature of it. Anecdotal evidence of me communicating with different people says that when people expect software to fail, they don't think, well, those bad software developers did this. They think this is what computers are. This is just the nature of computers. I think this is a dangerous notion. So I want users, I want just regular people to be more demanding. I want them to expect more quality of software. And this way, this will put pressure on engineers and developers and companies to meet that demand. But so far, we're still in this world where software breaks, software updates all the time for some reason, and, and it just usually becomes worse. I recently read a Twitter thread of a guy who was working on the Google Plus team. Uh, Google Plus is this weird social media site that Google wanted wanted to work, but it didn't really work. And they are shutting it down just like they shut down many, many products, both popular and not. So this is one of the products that was dead from the beginning, but they really wanted to push it. So they integrated it into all their subsystems. They forced users, even when they forced users, millions and millions of users to use it, It still failed. So now they are shutting it down. And the guy who was working on it decided to, not of course the guy, just one of the guys, uh, one of the designers who was working on it decided to voice his story. It's somewhat entertaining reading and somewhat disturbing. I'm not sure if it's all genuine. It feels genuine. It feels angry. And one of the things that struck me is that he said, now this is just what he says. I'm not sure if it's uh, validated in any way, but he said that the that the manager in charge of that project had genuinely had this idea and was trying to push this idea of making a major redesign of the whole service every six months, just to keep it fresh, you know, relevant. Why would you change the design in major way every six months? But this is what happens, maybe not 
every six months, but quite often with many, many apps and services and websites I use. There's almost never a good reason to do that other than they just really, and they had their own internal metrics of engagement or whatever, something that doesn't have to do with the end user experience, really. So lately I was feeling really frustrated and just tired of all that. I used for example, Google Chrome for years now. I've been using it since its first release ever. It's like that story, which is offensive to the frog community, by the way, about a frog being slowly boiled in a pot of water because temperature was rising really slowly and the frog didn't notice it. And I felt the same with Google Chrome and some other tools because over the years, they were adding more and more stuff and it's getting more and more power hungry and kind of slow. And at some point, it's just, if you just look at it from fresh perspective, it's just not so good anymore. Many selling points that brought us to this software was its speed, simplicity, minimalism, and now it's anything but. And with the other things that they are pushing with the privacy stuff and an account linkage and all that stuff, the last throw for me was the... Redesign. Of course, they wanted to redesign it to make this browsing experience new and fresh and different. While in reality, I am sure I'm not alone in this. I want my browser to be invisible. I don't care about it. I don't want it to be an experience. I don't want it to be a product. I don't want to engage with the browser. I just want to never notice it because it's just a window to the websites, to the content I want to consume. And the way it becomes invisible is it works and you are used to it and it doesn't really change. Now, I understand you have to add features and fix bugs and keep it up to date, of course. But I don't think changing the way everything looks, tabs, windows, buttons, shuffling buttons, changing their position, changing their behavior is ever useful. Even if the first version was not perfect, it becomes perfect, kind of, because people are used to it. If that button wasn't placed in the ergonomically best way, if it's there for 10 years, it becomes the best place because this is where people expect it to be. This is a naive idea, of course, but I think software shouldn't change after some period of time for the particular user. This is not the reality. This is just a, a dream I have of software being adaptive to the user so that it kind of sticks and evolves for me personally. So if I use something for 10 years, I want it then stay like that forever or until I decide otherwise. These changes can be really disruptive. And again, people just used to it. And people say, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it works. You use your browser or any other piece of software for years and years. And then one morning you come and it's just whole different. Imagine if that happened to your car. We decided to, you know, shuffle the buttons and uh, all your muscle memory is gone. But this is, this, is a, this is good. This is the new version. Enjoy. What does this have to do with Emacs? I'm getting there. <laughs> with all these frustrations, I decided to diligently and mindfully minimize software. I want less software because I cannot fight it. It will work like this. It will be updated. It will be changed. The companies will not stop in any foreseeable future. So there are two ways I can mitigate this so that I don't stress about it. One is I want less software. I want to ditch as much software as possible. And when I choose software, I want to choose something stable and maybe open source when possible. Open source is not actually my ethical requirement. I don't really have a problem with closed source programs. The reason is that closed source programs tend to be fragile in a way that company might die, the developer might just decide not to work on it, and then it's abandoned where, and then at some point it doesn't even work. Now, in the perfect world, that wouldn't be a problem because a program that works now should keep working forever. It's not a piece of meat. It shouldn't rot over time. But of course, the reality is it doesn't. The operating system, the frameworks, the underlying systems all change. And if you have a program that works now, it needs constant maintenance and constant 
attention from their developers forever, or it just stops working at some point. This is another problem, and I'm not going into that discussion right now, but uh, again, the reality is this is how it works. Unless the program is popular enough and open source enough, I don't feel particularly safe using it and in incorporating it into my routine. Emacs is kind of amazing in this way because it is free, it is open source, and it is super stable. It doesn't really change that much. A lot of new features are added, a lot of improvements are made version to version. But if you just move someone through time using a time machine from 20 years ago who was using, I don't know, Emacs version 9 or something, and just show them modern Emacs 26 or 27, they will be able to work. Not all the new features, of course, but all the old features, all the stuff that they are used to, it's all there, most of it. This is why I think there are so many people that use Emacs for decades. I got some comments to my previous episodes where people say, yeah, I'm just using it for like 25 years, which is almost all my life. And uh, I don't think there is any piece of this high-level software that is like this. I mean, we can use LS or grep for decades as well, but it's not it's just a utility. This high-level text editor gets alive for decades and people use it for decades. And, and I don't think people are ever saying like, oh, this new version of Emacs is just ruined the experience for me. It's so they updated everything. I hate it. So in this pursuit of having less software, I am trying to ditch my note-taking apps, which I've tried many, some of them proprietary, which of course I don't trust anymore since anything can happen and I'm not even sure I can get data out of it. Others that work with text files, which is good enough, but lack the customizations and the motions command that I'm already used in Emacs. So I'm, I'm moving all of that into org mode and I'm moving all of my writing into org mode. For writing, I've used different apps in the past and I have the same complaints and the same kind of worries. Now you might be thinking, well, putting all the eggs into one place. And yes, I kind of feel this way. It's weird. And if I keep adding more and more workflows into Emacs and then something happens to Emacs, then I'm screwed. But I can't really imagine something happening to it anytime soon. I'm not sure I can name any other software package, any other big piece of software that I'm sure will be alive and fine for most of my life. I think I can safely say that Emacs will be around my whole life because it has been around for my whole life so far. So yeah. So I know I, I said in the first episode that I don't have a goal of switching to Emacs and now it sounds like I, I'm just doing it. Uh, I'm of course still using other software. I occasionally open other editors but even without having this goal in mind, I kind of organically did it. And all of my programming and all of my writing now happens in Emacs. And it's not because I really wanted to, it just happened. And this is something I do enjoy. Within this framework of having less software, I am also moving out of cloud storage like Dropbox for my old files before. It's a nice idea of having it in the cloud and using uh, these big tires of terabytes and terabytes of storage, but it's quite painful if you have hundreds of thousands of files and about a terabyte worth of data, Dropbox becomes a bad idea. So I, I moved it to all to my NAS, just a nice home server. And now I have regular files and it's kind of kind of refreshing and uh, it's nice having something I completely understand and have have complete control of. And the same with photos. I use different cloud photo hosting solutions and now I just moved everything into files. Once more, I feel like I have some control over my digital assets. I can do everything with files. I can filter, I can sort, I can do things that other solutions require features for and require updates for and might break when they decide to change some features. So I started talking about how default empty Emacs is fast and kind of snappy and nice. And I want to 
move towards that. Of course, I don't want Emacs without all the customizations and packages that I've added. But if there is a way, maybe a bit less convenient, but still a way to do something with the built-in features, then I want that. So if it's possible to ditch some extension or disable something, I want to do that. I want less software. I basically want less code running anywhere. One example is smart parents. It's a nice, it's a really nice Emacs package and I use it and it allows you to move between different pairs, parents, square brackets, quotes, HTML tags, any kind of pair in your text. And it allows you to manipulate them in and out of the pair, moving between pairs, going up and down the hierarchy of pairs. Smart parents includes everything Paredit can do, but Paredit work mostly for Lisp languages. Smart parents works for any any text with any different pairs, and you can define your own pairs. Like if you have new weird notation, then you can define your own pairs. For me, there are two main features that I want. I want to move around my code, especially when I write Lisp or Clojure. I want to move easily in and out expressions and think of my code as a bunch of nested expressions, not like lines of text. And I want to automatically insert pair. So when I open a bracket, I want the closing bracket. When I open the quote, I want the closing quote. And which is more important, when I select a text and I hit a pair key, I want that text to be enclosed in that pair P. For example, if I have a word, I select it and I hit open brackets. I want closing brackets to be placed at the end of that selection. As far as I know, this last feature of automatically wrapping selected region in a pair is not built in. I cannot do it with built-in Emacs features. Correct me if I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I couldn't find it. But the motion commands, many of the motion commands are built in. I was trying really hard to create this nice configuration for myself, a, a set of key bindings for smart parents so that I can navigate inside pairs, go up and down the pairs, go to the opening and closing brackets, etc. And then I thought there must be, I think I, I've read somewhere that there is a built-in way to do this. And of course there is. Uh, I remember the book, that book I read when I first tried Emacs called Mastering Emacs. And it's one of those books that I keep going back to and rereading different sections because after some time it turns out I don't remember something. And now that it's relevant, I really need it. So that book was a really nice investment into learning Emacs. So I remember that there are built-in ways to work with pairs. It's mostly for Lisp, again, it's mostly for parents, but works with uh, some other pairs. Control and meta, you can go to the opening and the closing bracket with PN, which is nice because Control P and Control N is what you use to go up and down, and it kind of makes sense. If you are on the opening bracket, Control meta space will select this whole expression, which is really nice because I often need to cut something this way or wrap them into another layer of pairs. If I have, uh, say, a Lisp function and I want to wrap it into another pair of brackets, I can, from anywhere within that function, hit Control meta p to go to the beginning bracket, then Control meta space to select it, and then opening bracket to wrap it. It makes sense within this framework of movement commands in Emacs. You can also go up and down the hierarchy of pairs by using command meta u and d. And this covers most of the cases I need. So I just ditched all the customizations I was trying to make with smart parents, all the custom key bindings, because this is built in, it works, and it's enough. Now I still need smart parents for that smart wrapping and for slurping and barfing. I feel kind of clean. I feel, I don't know, uh, I have this nice feeling every time I use the built-in features instead of add-ons. Control A and E goes to the beginning and end of lines, but if you do it with the meta, it goes to the beginning and end of defunds. Any functions in Lisp, but it also works for many different languages, not just Lisp. And it's just a nice way of thinking about your code. It's not just lines of text. It's a bunch of functions or a bunch of expressions, a bunch of balanced pairs. Now, I mentioned that I often have to select the whole expression so that I can copy it or cut it. This is something that I'm not used to yet, but I'm slowly trying to 
kind of adapt in my workflows is this whole thing called the kill ring. Now, again, experienced CMAX developers might be rolling their eyes and saying, of course, you use the kill ring, but I don't yet. I use this extension called Simple Clip, which basically just separates your kill ring with the system buffer. They have nothing to do with one another. Kill commands don't copy your stuff into the system buffer. And you have your regular command or on Windows control, C, V, and X. And they just work with the system buffer and the kill ring is its own different thing with its own different key combinations. So I just use my system buffer and I just copy and paste as usual. This means if I want to copy anything, I have to select it first. And this is the way my mind works after years and years of using computers. There are many features in Emacs that allow you to cut or copy without selection. One of them is, again, if you are on the opening bracket and if you want to kill this expression, you don't have to select it. You can just hit command meta K. This saves you a keystroke and it places it into the kill ring where all the other copies or cuts are stored. There are many advantages to this. First is, yes, you have less keys to hit you kind of disassociate from this notion of having to select something. Uh, and one of the reasons that I wanted those shift left and right things is because I want to select something. And when I select something, it's mostly because I want to cut it or copy it or wrap it in pairs. And the second, you have all the previous cuts or copies in that kill ring. And you can, with something like cancel yank pop, you can actually see the list of all the things that you have copied or cut and select any previous thing. But this system requires you to kind of forget about the system buffer, the uh, kind of forget about the things outside of Emacs. You can merge them kind of and use this weird combination of the system buffer and the kill ring, and you can even use them with the common key bindings with the control command C, V, and X, but that's kind of messy, and it makes sense to keep using the default key combinations for working with the kill ring because they correlate to some other things that mnemonically make sense. So one of the challenges I, I set for myself is slowly trying to incorporate the kill ring and use it more. And every time I find myself selecting something to cut it, I now try to remember, okay, maybe I don't have to do two things if I can only do one. Maybe I don't have to select and cut when I can just kill. Once again, that Mastering Emacs book has a whole section on the kill ring, which is an important concept and all the different key combinations that allow you to work with it. So yeah, this is my confusing and rumbling description of how I'm trying to, to have less code in my life. This is the general feeling I have. You can customize Emacs as you wish, and I did it. It now behaves the way I want it for like 99% of the tasks. But every time I try to expand this and maybe do something new. I have to maintain this customization and kind of do more work. And it's fine. This is what extensible means for the editor. But it kind of makes sense to sometimes not fight it. It's easier in the long run to use Emacs if you don't fight most of the defaults. So that thing in the beginning I said about org mode and having shift and alt keys available everywhere. The only reason I had that problem is I want the non-default Emacs movement and I want the selection. But if I went with the default Emacs movements and I embrace the kill commands that operate on predefined blocks instead of selecting something to kill it, then I wouldn't have to do anything with Dorgmat. It would, it would just be fine because, well, of course, it's designed for that system. After seeing all the features and all the power of customizations and being able to do all that, I still come to this conclusion that maybe it makes more sense to not fight the defaults when possible. I might compromise on some usability because, well, I still use other software, but it's totally possible to completely switch your defaults in different contexts. I know this because a few years back I was working at a company and we were using Windows. Uh, we were using Windows for development and we were developing Windows software. So during the day I was using Windows 
and outside of work I was using Mac and it's a completely different set of defaults and, and keys and even the keyboard is different and it was fine I just click and I use a different thing and sometimes I had to use Windows inside a VM on my Mac and it was not perfect but it was still fine I was just I was just switching instantly into this different mindset maybe I can do the same within my system because if I have Emacs open I just in this different mode where I have to operate differently and this is fine. Now this is a dangerous path because uh, of course as it happens you want more and more stuff put inside Emacs because you just find this movement and all the features comfortable and you want them everywhere and this kind of goes against my idea of having less packages and, and less features added but we'll see how it goes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all the comments and letters I received. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, just this morning, I woke up with an email from a listener who just said thank you. And uh, it actually motivated me to record this podcast because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if today is the day, but then I woke up, I saw this email. So thank you, Mike Holsather. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly. You motivated me to record this podcast this morning. I really enjoy making this. There are many things I want to discuss. And uh, this is the time in my life where I'm slowly moving away from my main company, from my main job, and I'm trying new different things. So I'm trying to write a book and I'm trying these new podcasts. And uh, I opened my new blog and writing articles on computer science and stuff like that. So so I decided to launch Patreon for this podcast. Patreon.com is a way to support creators you like. And the way I set it up for EmacsCast is per episode basis. I don't think I will make more than four episodes per month. If you like this podcast, if you want to affect the way it goes forward, please consider supporting me on it's patreon.com slash EmacsCast. Thank you.